Learning a new skill takes a lot of patience and practice. Making mistakes is part of the process and how you get better at things. My name is Corbin Dunn and this is my timber frame woodshed. My goal with this video is to inspire you to learn timber framing by watching me figure out how to build one. I start from scratch, milling raw trees into usable lumber, setting a foundation, hand cutting the joinery, and assembling everything. I'm sharing my CAD file and plans that you can use as a base for your own project. This project started last year when I began building my garage. I dropped several trees that were in the way and set aside the logs. Ideally, it's best to mill a tree within a few days of it being dropped, but I only had an Alaska mill for my chainsaw and I was too busy building the garage. The logs gave me a reason to buy a new tool. I purchased a Woodland Mills HM130 Max portable sawmill. This machine is a horizontal bandsaw that runs on some metal rails. I really enjoy using the mill and I think it was a great purchase. It's easy to use and it's quick to make square lumber. Fresh cut lumber always tends to warp and check. I mitigated some of the warping by making a level base and sealing the end grain while they dried out a bit. Before I started milling the wood, I had to know what size timbers I would need. I designed the project in CAD using Fusion 360. The size was based entirely on the space around my existing wood pile, but I also had to modify it a bit to accommodate the maximum length I could mill on my HM130 Max. The back side of the lean to appears to be floating, but that's because I intend to rest the back beam on my hillside. My posts were made of some rough sawn actual 6x6 timbers. The horizontal beams were 6x8 timbers. The connecting girts were 6x6, and the rafters were 2x8s. Braces were cut from a 4x8 to get the desired curve and not be too skinny. While I waited for the wood to dry, I did my foundation layout. I struggled quite a bit when figuring out my post locations. I watched several videos on YouTube, which I'll reference in the description, and I learned a lot of basic tips on how to use string for layout. However, my specific location gave me some difficulties. Having the back beam high up on the hillside meant I had to figure out some clever way to align my front posts because they were not in the same horizontal plane as the front posts. The pavement was in the way of where I needed to put some layout stakes and I had to offset some locations to work around that by using multiple batter boards. Eventually, I came to the conclusion that I had to do a virtual layout high up on my front post locations in order to get everything to line up. I also purchased a basic laser level to help me align all the pieces. The Simpson anchors require a two inch minimum side cover. This meant I had to use at least a 10 inch diameter sono tube. Six inches of timber plus two inches on each side gives me about 10 inches. I opted for 12 inch tubes just to be on the safe side and put them down to a depth of 16 inches, which is what's recommended in my area due to the frost line. Digging holes by hand was not fun. And in some spots I had large boulders that prevented me from going deep enough. I didn't worry about too much I attached a plumb bob to a string and hung it from the upper batter boards to determine the exact center of the sound tubes. The long string made it a bit difficult to get an accurate position as the wind would blow it around a bit. I backfilled the edges and made sure it was all plumb and straight as I was doing so. Once I had the three front tubes in the ground, I set down my laser and marked the top off on all of them at the exact same spot. The line was a bit faint in the bright sunlight, but good enough for me to see as a guide to cut off the tubes at the exact same spot. Once I cut the tube front off, I could see the laser on the back portion and finish the cut. I only did this for the front tubes and the back tubes, I ended up aligning the tops of all three instead of trimming to fit. The top tubes coincided with some large boulders sticking out of the earth holding up the hillside. So I simply scribed the tube to the boulder and figured the concrete on the rock would be stable enough. I backfilled the tubes so they had at least the required 16 inches of ground cover. I figured it wouldn't hurt to wire the ground a bit and compact it as I went along. 
I didn't record any video of me actually pouring the concrete. My hands were too dirty to touch the camera. I did put a few pieces of rebar in and carefully lined the anchors based on my string lines. I let the timbers set for about three weeks to dry. The tree was cut down over a year ago, but the wood was still really wet inside. Three weeks really isn't enough time to let the wood fully dry, but I heard a lot of timber frames are built with green lumber, so I decided to proceed. There are several ways to lay out joinery in the timber frame, and Beamer's book does a good job of describing the techniques. I opted due to a combination of the square rule along with the scribe rule. I didn't have too many joints to cut, and the timbers didn't vary too large of a degree to cause me any issues. My main goal was to lay out everything with respect to a particular reference face. I read that many people use a Borman layout template to pencil in their joinery locations. This tool is hard to get and costs around $200 when you can find it. I decided to do a quick design in Fusion 360 and 3D printed my own for a couple of bucks. Jump to the description down in the STL and pull one up for yourself. This template saved a lot of time during the layout. My design required a few basic joints to be cut. The first one here is a dovetail that connects the side girt to the horizontal back beam. The depth of it was limited due to the concrete anchor hardware. I cut the joint a little loose and I planned on wedging it during assembly. I sped the video up by 20x. Cutting stuff by hand takes a lot of time, but it's pretty enjoyable work. The dovetail shape made it a bit difficult to cut the back fibers of the mortise. I flipped the beam on its side and I used a smaller chisel to work the corners a bit. At one point I experimented with routing out the waist, but that didn't work too well. Next I cut the tenon and the side girt. Cutting the tenon first required cutting the girt close to its final length. My neighbor loaned me his big beam saw. I set up a jig to align the cut and trim the pieces. I was careful to support the off cut to avoid tear out if it fell off. The tenon was cut in a typical machine tool way. I first made a series of small cuts with my circular saw and then knocked it out with a chisel. I was sure to keep the cuts about 1 16th of an inch away from my final line. I could then flip it on the side and score my line with the circular saw. Then out came the chisel and I finished up the detail work. After completing the back beam joinery, I could then move on to the front tenon on my side gird. This would become a wedge dovetail joint. It is designed to resist the outward thrust of the roof. This is one of the strongest tension joints in timber framing. I had to remove a lot of waste from the cheeks of the tenons, so I first used the circular saw to score the waste. The first cut was done right at the cheek line, nearly at full depth. I then backed off the saw depth to about 1 16th of an inch above the line and made more cuts. This was easy to knock out with the chisel. The cheek had a lot of surface area, so I could use my hand plane to trim it flat. I also used a rabbit plane to get right up to the edge. A shoulder plane is an ideal tool for planing corners, but I don't own one and had to make do with what I had. I checked the one and a half inch tenon thickness with a simple plywood jig that I precisely cut out on the table saw. The half dovetail triangle part was easy to remove, a quick cut on the top with a circular saw, and then some paring down with the chisel. The next joint is the mortise for the half dovetail. Here I turned on the cross section analysis in Fusion so you can see how the girt fits into the post and why it needs to be larger in order to drop it in. The empty area on top will be filled in with a hardwood wedge. Cutting mortises is typically done with a special power tool called the chain mortiser. It looks like a mini chainsaw that plunges into the wood and hogs out a lot of material. They cost several thousand dollars, so I opted to do the mortises by hand. I got rid of most of the waste material by drilling one and a half inch holes. The hard part about drilling was to keep the bit perfectly perpendicular to my cutting surface. I came up with a simple solution by making a quick jig. I drilled a one and a half inch hole in a cutoff that was about four inches tall and screwed it to a larger piece of plywood. I used my drill press and a spade bit to get perfectly perpendicular. The piece of plywood allowed me to clamp the jig to the timber. Since it is a through mortise, I realized it was best to drill halfway through, flip the post over, and drill through the other half. 
This would help account for any issues with the drill bit not being quite straight. The first mortise was the hardest cut due to the angles for the wedge dovetail and required a lot of handwork to finish. The last journey that I had to cut was the mortise and tenons for the posts going into the front top beam. These were done in the same way as the other joinery, but I learned it was better to sever the fibers on my layout line with a chisel before drilling to avoid tear out and get sharper corners. I'll skip over the other work as it's repetitive. It can be tough to cut a nice curve in a six inch deep timber. I first made a plywood template by bending a thin piece of wood along the curve and marking it with a pencil. I cut the template on my bandsaw and used this to mark each timber with the same pattern. I tried using a long sawzall blade to cut the timber, but it was too slow and cumbersome. I set on using the circular saw to thin out the waste and then knock it out with a chisel. My saw wasn't deep enough to do half the depth, so it left a large area in the middle that was easy to cut out with the sawzall. I put a 40 grit sanding disc on my grinder and I finished off the curve. The process was pretty quick and left a pretty good finish. I'll admit that I cheated for the 45 degree braces and I didn't do a traditional timber frame mortise and tenon. Instead, I planned to save some time and use timber lock screws to hold them in place. I still had to make the curve on them, but the size was more portable. I wanted a very specific radius for my braces. I knew the dimension based on the plans I drew, and I set out two pieces of plywood at the radius distance. I stuck a nail at the circle center of one scrap piece of plywood and used a pencil on a long string to draw the radius on my template plywood. I cut it out with the bandsaw and smoothed the curve a bit with a spoke shave. And then replicated the pattern on all my braces. Cutting them out with the bandsaw and leaving a rough saw and finish. Before I could assemble the frame, I needed to fabricate some hardwood wedges and pins. I cut some wedges out of an oak that I had laying around, bandsawing the rough shape and smoothing it out on my sander. I don't have a wood lathe, but I didn't mind getting my metal lathe a little dirty making some dowels out of maple. These were probably way more precise than I needed, but it gave me a handful of pegs that I could use. Of course the pegs had to have holes to go into. I drilled one inch peg holes into the half dovetail and three quarter inch holes in the other locations. The holes were slightly offset in the tenons to allow draw boring during assembly, which would pull it tightly together. I assembled the main front bent on the ground, but I later had an issue with this. I used a ratchet to draw the joint together and then drove in the peg with a hammer. Each brace was scribed to fit the individual corner it was destined for, and I sunk a single timber lock screw into it. I later decided to add a second screw to help prevent any rotation. Once the front beam was assembled, I moved on to the back beam. I dropped it onto the rear concrete posts with my tractor and forks. It wasn't too heavy, but it helped get it close to where I needed it to be. It was slightly thicker than six inches, so I had to use the router to trim about one eighth of an inch off the back in order for it to fit into the anchors. I also spent a bit of time leveling the beam by trimming the bottom and shimming one corner. Once I was happy with the beam location, I put some stain on the portions underneath the hardware and nailed it to the anchors. I set the horizontal side girts into place with the help of my wife. She dropped in the back dovetail and we used a couple of 2x4s to support the front tenons at just the right height to slip into the front posts. Sometimes my initial plan doesn't work. I figured we could raise the bent with the tractor, but as I raised the forks, the post was putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the joinery, making it bend and creak a lot. I was pretty sure it would break, so I lowered it back down and thought about how I could raise it. Typically, a large group of people could have raised a barn like this, or a bent like this, 
but I had to figure out how to do it by myself or with my wife's help. I opted to disassemble the joinery for the bent, which was pretty easy to do. My wife helped me with the first post, but it was easy enough for me to do solo for the other one. I pegged the horizontal girt to the post and then hammered in the wedge to lock the dovetail. The center post was held in place with some scrap 2x4s. At this point I could easily pick up the front beam and hold it in place with my tractor forks. I lowered it down bit by bit onto the tenons and hammered back in the pins to hold it together. The 45s were screwed back into place and I ended up adding a second bolt to make it a little tighter. I used some hardwood shims to wedge the back dovetails in tighter. This will hold them tight even if the wood shrinks a bit. I added some side braces to help prevent any racking. Then nailed on the front anchors to the front posts using galvanized nails. Before I did this, I did put some oil on the bottom of the wood. I didn't want to spend a lot of time with the rafter joinery. I made another plywood template for the front rafter curve and cut it out with my jigsaw. I scribed the bird's mouth to fit based on the actual location and cut it out with a circular saw and jigsaw. The rafters were installed with galvanized nails that I shot on with my nail gun. I installed the first one, then used the rafter blocking pieces as a spacer for each subsequent rafter. This allowed me to quickly install the rafters without having to do a lot of measuring. The last rafter was nailed on before my blocking, and I trimmed the last block to a custom fit. Also note that I cut an angle at the top of the block in with my table saw to match the roof pitch. At this point I had the raw frame all completed. I opted to put on the finish before I did the roof because I thought it would be easier to access the rafters. I bought several gallons of Cabot timber frame oil and brushed it on. Initially, I was going to put purlins across the rafters and drop on some corrugated roofing. I read the roofing installation guide and they recommended screws every 16 inches on center in the field and 12 inches on the edges. I started to get worried about the thin metal roofing supporting heavy snow, particularly since a lot of snow won't slip off the roof due to the back end being uphill. I decided to first lay down some plywood, even though it cost a lot more and meant I wouldn't be using any of my own wood for this portion. On top of the plywood, I dropped down some tar paper as an ad insurance against some water. Some cheap Home Depot drip edges went on the edges and I tossed on the corrugated roofing with the appropriate screws. This is cheap Home Depot corrugated roofing. It's really thin and I don't think I'll use it again because we get a lot of snow. I would have preferred some rusted roofing material to blend in a little more naturally with the surroundings but this project was already starting to cost too much and I didn't want to spend extra money on it. I also worried the rust would make it a bit tacky and not let snow slip off. Once the roof was completed, I added it on a side bottom wood piece for the siding to attach to. Off camera, I milled some fresh 1x8s, scribed each to fit, stained it, and nailed it on. The wood was fresh cut and I knew it would shrink. You can already see some of the gaps forming, which is totally fine for a firewood shed like this. Took me a full day to fill the shed up with firewood, but it looks great completed. Although I might need some doors to keep out the snow and that'll be another project.